Coming up on this week's show, the retro secrets in the new Call of Duty game. Playing your Switch with an Atari joystick. And we talk to Tim Gilberts, the author of The Quill. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you with our amazing mates at Bitmap Books, and we're going to be telling you about their brilliant new Game Boy box art collection very soon. And stay listening for an amazing offer on Retro Gamer magazine. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 251, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show. Now, we thought we'd give you a nice little welcome if you are a new listener as well, because I imagine we've had quite a lot of people who are checking out the show for the first time over the last couple of weeks. As, of course, the way the show works is we bring you a guest on the second half, and we'll tell you more about that because we've got a great one this week. But in the first 20 minutes or so, we recap on the big retro gaming stories of the week. And when we've been looking around for retro gaming stories, the news from the last seven days, we seem to come up quite a lot in the last week. Yeah, I was looking at the news this morning. So we have a an Excel spreadsheet that we all share and we all put on, you know, our news that we spotted in the week. And I'm Googling stuff and I keep seeing about this amazing bug that's been discovered in the Dreamcast <laughs> after 20 years. It's exclusive <laughs> from uh, John Bird. And I keep clicking on it. And I'm like, that was our guest last week. This is our news. <laughs> but it was really cool to see because we've been doing this now for five years, 251 episodes, like yeah. you say. And we're the news. Like, I, I, I mean, obviously, we're not like the main news. Like, oh my God. But it was just interesting to see us on some news articles and stuff. And it was just really cool. And it's, you know, a few people reached out to us and said how cool it was to get that exclusive. It was interesting because I'd been working on that episode with John for a while. And yeah. John actually wrote it in like a kind of storyboard form. Mm. And, and, and like he, he narrated it. It was like a, somebody told me it sounded like a murder investigation. <laughs> or, a, or like a kind of crime filler, yeah. uh, thriller going on, basically, and yeah. um, an audio book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I was wondering how's this going to go down with listeners. And the funny thing was, when it came out, a few people were going, "What bug is it? Tell me which bug it is." And it's like, well, if you listen, it's one that's yeah. not yeah, been yeah, discussed that, before. <laughs> and it turns out people had actually listened, and you know, we went onto Nintendo Life. Thanks so much, Nintendo Life. We love you. And we're always covering your stories as well. So it's really good to be on a site that we actually get the news from. <laughs> it's mad, really. I love the amount of tweets that we had during the week as well from people that are like, oh, I didn't know about this podcast. I'll, I'll check it out. It's you know, really interesting. I'm going to listen every week now. So if you were one of those, great to have you on board. Um, and of course, if you have been a listener for many years, which I know a lot of people have. Great to have you back for another episode. Now, today, we are going to be talking about something really old school, going back to the ZX81 and the Specky days, and covering a topic that we've just been loving recently. It's adventure game time again, Ravi. Yeah, I, I think I'm obsessed with adventure games at the moment. <laughs> we've had so many guests on, and uh, this week is no different. We've got Tim Gilberts on. Now, Tim Gilberts is an author of The Quill, you think about stuff today like Unity, uh, there was the arcade game design uh, tools. There was all these games that were created so people could create games. And the Quill was a text adventure based one. So, you know, it enabled users to create their own text adventures. A uh, title came out from that. But also, you know, Tim, he was like 16 when he started yeah. this. It was a real family business, Britsoft style and also he talks about schools uh in the 70s and and what was available in the schools at the time because we all went to school we had the bbc's we had the um acorns in the uk at least and we know there was a lot of apple in america well tim tells us what was going on in the 70s with teleprinters and uh, mainframes and all that fun stuff yeah i love hearing the stories about you know like playing text adventure games on teletypes which i've actually seen in person <laughs> you know the uh, the retro computer museum in leicester we'll talk more about that in the interview but it's a really interesting one this because like you said he was 16 years old um, him and his dad founded this company gilsoft became you know a really big publisher particularly on the zx81 and the spectrum and also got into a lot of other stuff as well like they did like you know clones of arcade games and today he's actually working on the spectrum next as well so it's just a really good nostalgic chat i mean we do obviously talk a lot about adventure games but even just in general i think anyone that wants a really good insight into what was happening in britain in particular back in the late 70s early 80s and you're gonna get loads out of this one there's a new system called adventure on which is a text game creation kind of tool uh we talk about that but we had to go back and talk about the original which was the quill 
Yeah, absolutely. So the Quill, I mean, again, like you said, it just made writing text adventure games back then easy. I mean, I mentioned it in the interview. I had a go at writing a text adventure with my friend, thinking that, you know, oh, this is going to be easy. You don't need graphics or anything. It's just text. And then we kind of got, you know, by the time we'd interweaved all the different things a player could do and all the different paths and all the things they'd ask, I mean, it just got into a complete mess. (laughs) And I think we gave up on it at the end. You know, we'd really overstretched ourselves. But it just opened it up to everyone. So Tim Gilberts is going to be our special guest talking about the Quill and Gilsoft very soon on the Retro Owl podcast. Now we have got some really good news stories to talk about this week. Before we do, let's give a huge welcome to one of our favourite publishers in the world, our amazing friends at Bitmap Books, who are back on board bringing you the Retro Owl podcast this week. We love working with Bitmap Books, don't we? Yeah, I absolutely love Bitmap Books. We've worked with them a few times before and we've been really lucky because they've sent us out some free copies of their books in the past and they're just amazing quality. They're just like, they're the type of thing, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again, sometimes for Christmas, I'm a big retro game and my mum might buy me one of these little silly retro game, you know, arcade things from, you know, from Argos or something. But honestly, I would much, much, much rather a Bitmap book. They're absolutely amazing books, these are. And I'm so thrilled that we're sponsored by them again. Well, this one's uh, especially for you, Joe, as well, because it's uh, the Game Boy box art collection. And we all know you're the big Game Boy fan, but also... Did you keep any of those boxes or were they all trash straight away? <laughs> they, were all, they were all trashed by my mum to bring her up again, <laughs> funny enough. It's her birthday today as well, so I keep talking about her. But yeah, she did, she did trash my boxes when I was a kid. So I need to get my hands on this new Game Boy uh, box art collection book to relive my childhood and just, you know, kind of look at, the, <laughs> look at those box arts and just remember what was thrown in the bin all those years ago. <laughs> I mean, if you haven't seen a Bitmap Books book before, um, I've got a few on the shelf. And whenever my friends come round, you know, even people that are not video game fans, they always like, you know, it always grabs their attention. They always pull it out and have a look through it because they're beautifully made. And they really are a celebration of video games like this one. I mean, if you're an old school Game Boy fan like Joe, or maybe you're just getting into the system recently, the Game Boy Box Art Collection is a celebration of some of the finest cover artwork for the monochrome Marvel, which, of course, was really the kickstart of the handheld games industry for a lot of people, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, the Game Boy was the introduction, but also, like I said, a lot of people would get loose carts, there'd be a whole second-hand market. So to see some of this box art, you know, I've never seen it myself before, and it's just absolutely fantastic to see some of these boxes, but also the quality and the kind of printing that they have them in. It's a really nice way of displaying it but also it's in a cute little book as well yeah i mean it's beautifully made but also what they've done is they've actually worked closely with some of the world's biggest game boy collectors and they put together a really varied selection of titles that span both the eastern and the western releases so what you're going to get is i mean they've actually translated some of the japanese titles for the first time and they give you like screenshots on each page you can actually see what the games look like too and it's 372 pages long game boy the box art collection is also available in a few different editions if you're a bit of a collector as well there are silver and gold editions with an exclusive cover illustration from super plain rare legend will overton which uh, you're also getting an a2 poster a sturdy metal box these are limited in numbers as well so if you are a collector you need to get your hands on this and you can pre-order your copy right now of game boy the box art collection by heading to the website bitmapbooks.co.uk and please show a bit of love to our amazing friends at bitmap books now let's get into this week's news stories um the first one joe the new call of duty game what yeah so we, we've got a modern game on the show turn the this, show off <laughs> i i did e- not even know that there was a new call of duty game but i knew that dan would buy it <laughs> you know what you know it's right here yeah oh, really? I, did, I did every year every there we year. go I he's picked, always let down <laughs> i haven't picked it up yet um and i i knew it was out i knew it was coming out and i usually i usually pick call of duty up every two or three years because i do like them and I usually try to make sure I pick one of the ones with zombies mode on. Um, and I've, I've messed up this year because if I bought last year's and it didn't have zombies and this year's had zombies. But we're not here to talk about Call of Duty and we're not here to talk about zombies. We're here to talk about the retro arcade machines in the new Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. So I read this this morning, which I thought was really cool. And it's a bit of a throwback to the first Black Ops game because obviously you had the, um, is it Zork in that one? Yeah. Yeah. In this one, Essentially, from what I understand, in the main campaign, you have a safe house. And as you play through the campaign each level, you can find arcade machines in like, you know, like the burnt out buildings and stuff like that. 
And as you find them, they become playable in your safe house. So there's 10 playable arcade games in there with the full game. So you get Pitfall 2, you get Enduro, Brainstorming, Pitfall 1, River Raid, Grand Prix, Fishing Derby, Boxing, Kaboom, and Chopper Command, all in your safe house, which I thought was insane. So it's not just one game. You've got 10 games this time. It's interesting. It's uh, kind of like Inception, isn't it? A game inside a game. Yeah. Like, Mm. you know... I remember Duke Nukem 3D, and I think it had a copy of Wolfenstein in there. Yeah, um, yeah. You'd go up and you'd play one of the arcade machines. But also I'm thinking of, like we mentioned the other day, loading screens with, yeah. um, you know, the Namco um, ones where they had Space with Invaders Gallagher loading up yeah. for yeah. Uh, Gallagher. That was it for Ridge yeah. Racer, yeah. This is cool as well because, I mean, these are all obviously... Activision games, mm. and I think they're all they're all Atari twenty six hundred games. Yeah, I um, think they are. So, yeah, yeah, they're kind of gone back to their roots. So it is called something boxing. I I have played that on the Atari twenty six hundred. That's kind of that um overhead boxing yeah, game. And their, their arms <laughs> just go out straight, and they've got like the. They, I feel like they've got big noses, like from above. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was it was an interesting it was interesting to see that. Yeah. Yeah, and you got um, obviously Kaboom as well. That was kind of where a guy drops bombs on you and you got to kind of avoid it. Mm. Um, Chopper Command, that was Bob Whitehead. That was kind of like Defender in the yeah. desert. So some of these games, I mean, you know, for Atari 2600 games, Activision generally did a lot of the best games on that platform. So yeah. if one of a distraction from the latest Call of Duty game. <laughs> I've played the online. I've actually got into the campaign yet. So Do you ever play I've the campaign? Quite... Do you just play some online? Some years I do. Oh, yeah, do I mean, generally, I just do the online stuff really, but... Um, because I mean, you know, Call of Duty. Again, it's one of these games that I hate myself for buying it every year. Because <laughs> every year I'm like, is it, it's kind of the FIFA of yeah. first-person shooters, yeah. isn't it? And you're just like, shall really I buy is. it? And then I, I do it. I, go, I, I won't buy it. I wasn't going to buy it last year because it didn't have zombies. And then I'm like, oh, my friends are playing it and they're all playing yeah. it online. So I get it. And, I, and, and I'm never ready to move on because I don't play it like every night. Or I just play it every now and then. And now the new one's out. And I'm like, I've not finished the other one. I, I'd still play that one. <laughs> like... Oh, it's, it's this is cool. This is it's cool interesting that they've got um, Pitfall Two in there as well because Pitfall yeah. was like a huge game. Uh, David Crane de- mm, yeah. designed it, and it was you know one of Activision's massive titles. And to be honest, it's the only title I recognise out of that list. Yeah, I mean, the second game was, like, really advanced for the 2600 as well. Um, I just imagine that my brother messaging me, how far have you got with the campaign then? Are you playing it? I'm like, yeah, just... uh, just (laughs) I'm on level three of Pitfall. (laughs) (laughs) So if you have got... I bought this um, £50 game and all I'm doing is playing Pitfall (laughs) (laughs) 2. That is so me. (laughs) So if you do want to unlock those hidden arcade games in the new Call of Duty game, I'll put a link to the article. You can see how to get them all in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Maybe you want to go old school on your Switch as well, because we were talking last week about how the Switch is one of our favourite platforms for retro games. But obviously playing them with the Joy-Con controllers doesn't always feel that authentic. But doing it with an original Atari joystick... Yeah, I mean, my first question is, will it? Does it have drift? You know, that's the first thing I'm thinking of. But no, <laughs> jokes aside, yeah, it, funny. Once again, we're talking about Atari, but uh, a YouTuber, um, will it work? Has done this. He's got an original Atari 2600 controller. The let me get this right. The Atari the C- CX10. The CX. No, he's got the CX40. I believe it is. Oh, the later one. The okay. later that, one. That, that was my teething joystick. You know, there I told you years ago. I used to chew on a joystick when I was a baby. <laughs> that was the one. Yeah. Well, he's got the very one that Ravi used to chew on. <laughs> he's got it connected up to his Switch, and he's been playing Breath of the Wild with it, wow. which I think is absolutely amazing. But what I love about this was when I first saw this, I thought, Oh, here we go. There's going to be some soldering magic here. He's taken it apart. He's got it, you know, Frankenstein monsters hardwired into the Switch. But actually, um, Ravi was telling me how easy this is actually is um, for people to go out there and do it themselves. Yeah, this is crazy. It's just done with adapters, essentially. And uh, there's one called, from Rafnet here, which is a D-sub um, okay. one. So it's essentially Genesis, Sega Master System, Atari. Mm. You can probably have your Amiga stuff on there. And um, this connects with your Wii or GameCube. So... You know those GameCube controller ports that you had? Yes. It connects with that. So also, I suspect this probably works with the Wii U if you mm. have the um, adapter for it, uh, for yeah. the GameCube controllers. Now, this is only 30 quid. Already, okay. that is an awesome thing, but it's out of stock, of course. Everybody 
one swan <laughs> after seeing this video. But what they have done to make it work on the Switch is they've got a, a wireless adapter for the Switch, which I, I've never seen this before. It's by um, 8-Bit Do. It's called the G-Bros Wireless Adapter for the Switch. And it's just this little unit that looks like it's powered by um, uh, USB. And you just plug the controller um, <laughs> straight into there. So he's plugged one adapter into another adapter and it's all mapped it and he's you able just daisy chain them essentially so he's just daisy chain them so but it, also yeah. you can um you so can map the buttons yeah so essentially he's using where some people because we've got all these competitive players and stuff who use gamecube controllers with smash bros on the switch but he's essentially daisy chained another one that converts it to to the uh, atari one yeah yeah so he's got this d sub one which yeah. is amazing i did not know you can get these controllers and like a lot of people have said to me, oh, the GameCube controllers are the best in yeah. this system. But, oh, man, I can imagine playing it with an old Mega Drive pad or something. <laughs> that could be <laughs> so cool. So I really want to see these um, RAFNET um, devices, you know, uh, being made available again. You know, they are saying in the article that he does play um, Zelda Breath of the Wild in there as well, which obviously you've only got one fire button on the Atari <laughs> joystick. Luckily, you can remap it, but it said, you know, if you are playing that, you're going to have to keep going in and remapping it to the different things that you want to do. It'll be like Street Fighter on the Amiga, where you've got to do like one button <laughs> up, down, left, right. <laughs> All these crazy combos. Uh, yeah, it doesn't sound the most practical way to play games like that. But they do also point out as well um, that, you know, for there is a lot of retro games on the Switch, for example, playing something like Donkey Kong. If you're playing that with like a CX-10 or a CX-40 Atari stick, that is a bit more akin to playing the original arcade version of the game. Yeah, imagine Tropical Freeze with that or like, uh, oh yeah, that'd be some fantastic titles. Like I can imagine playing the Street Fighter uh, with the original Mega Drive pads or, or something like that would really bring back some nostalgia. So if you want to watch his video, I actually love the stuff that he covers on his channel as well. I mean, another video that he did recently was um, hooking up a, an iOmega zip drive to an Apple Watch. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll enjoy it. I'll put a link to that in our show notes as well at the retrohour.com. Um, now, Worms, obviously, that's a, a title that we love. I mean, I think we're all fans of Worms on this show, aren't we? Oh, yep. Huge, huge Worms fan, yeah. Uh, one of the best titles ever, I think. Well, tell us about this new collection then that's coming to the Evercade. Yeah, so the Evercade is a, a little machine, and the nice thing about the Evercade is they release these collections. So you, you get it in cartridges, and you get like three or four titles with them. Now they've done a deal with um, Team Seventeen, and Team Seventeen own all the Worms franchise. I think for about a couple of years, all Team Seventeen did was produce bloody Worms titles yeah. until they actually <laughs> got onto the indie indie game and came up with some new stuff. But um, they have got. Some of the best Worms titles here. So they've got the original Worms and they've got Worms Armageddon. And now Armageddon is just an absolutely beautiful game. I wonder if it's going to come with all the extra DLC and all the fan-made content already put in there. And then they've got Worms Blast. And Worms Blast is it's nothing like the original Worms franchise. It's essentially Bubble Bubble and Puzzles games in, in the kind of Worms world. But there was tons that, that came out. There was Worms Golf. There was Worms Fishing. <laughs> probably Worms Mall or something. I don't know. <laughs> was Worms Blast a GameCube game? I do vividly remember it. I think so. I, I yeah. it passed me by, but I remember seeing I, it. And this, I wasn't sure yeah. which one Worms Blast was. I thought it might have been the one that came out when the Xbox One came out, and it was like built into it or something. I thought it might have been one of the more modern ones, but. I think Rabbit. Yeah, well, no, that was the, the, WMD, the recent one was WMD, and that that oh, would have been yeah. really nice That's to the one kind I'm of put in there. there. But I don't know if the hardware would have been able to take WMD because nah. there's a lot of effects. But this is all coming on yeah. one cartridge for the Evercade, is it? Yeah, so three games on one cartridge. Uh, you've got Armageddon in there as well, and yeah, just Armageddon alone I would get. But I don't know how well it's going to work on that tiny screen. Hmm. Yeah, because it's only a little screen, isn't it? And this is coming out in May 2021, and pre-orders are opening this week, I believe, for it, which is cool. And mm. they usually it's usually quite cheap, isn't it? The game sort they're usually only like 15 pounds for the collections, aren't they? Yeah, it's it's a nice little deal, and you know, I kind of like it actually having this choice of selections rather than just a big ton of ROMs that you're constantly scrolling through and you can't kind of make a decision. You know, sometimes it's nice to have a, a curated collection for you. 
And I, I like the fact they've got the original Worms in there because that was the one that I spent a lot of time on as a kid. But the one I really liked that I wish was on here is Director's Cut. Yeah, you'll never, which get, obviously- you'll never get DC on any other platform but the Amiga. Yeah, which is it's a shame. I mean, it's cool having an, an Amiga exclusive because that title was kind of a, a goodbye to the Amiga from Team 17. Well, essentially, Armageddon is DC. It's yeah. like DC with a bit more upgraded graphics. All of the weapons uh, that were on DC went onto Armageddon and stuff. So it mm. was really the testing ground before that. Well, let's talk about the new Super Mario Game & Watch. Now, we covered this when it first got announced a while ago. Um, people are finally starting to get them in their hands right now. I know friend Adam, he's been um, showing me his Game & Watch on Facebook over the last couple of days. Looks a really nice little machine. But even before this was released last Friday... Some people managed to get their hands on it a little bit early, and, of course, it was hacked straight away. Yeah, so a hacker named Stack Smashing got his hands on this uh, a couple of days before it actually came out, because some of them were actually sent out early. Uh, And Mm. essentially, what he did, I'm no hacker, Ravi usually knows a little bit more about these things, but from what I understand, just to put it in simpleton terms, he has hacked it, (laughs) taken it apart, and essentially he has got past the... The Nintendo loading screen, which is essentially that was actually the security of the game and watch that was actually to stop it from, uh, you know, people hacking it and stuff. And he's got round it. And essentially the, the first thing he's done is he's found that it is ROMs on there, which is now leading us to think, are we actually going to be able to hack this and get a portable Nintendo system, which would be really yeah, cool. NES ROMs it runs. Yeah, because it's running NES ROMs on there. So essentially his his question is are we going to be able to put some roms on here and get get it you know running running roms uh, as a handheld which would be really cool um but he's also interestingly there's actually been a language glitch in it um which has been which we haven't covered but apparently they were shipped with a language error in there um and that was the first thing he did it was he fixed the language error in the english for it (laughs) um but yeah um rather than it coming up what's quite funny is rather than it coming up with the nintendo logo when you boot it up it now comes up with the hacked logo which i thought was quite cool yeah, because the Game of Watch, I mean, it's a lovely little form factor. Mm. Um, and these new ones, I mean, they're, they're ARM processor-based. Mm. Uh, looking at the amount of memory you've got on there, I mean, it looks like, it, apparently there's 128K okay. of flash memory, and you've got uh, essentially about a megabyte of RAM on there mm. as well, which obviously is going to be enough to run pretty much any NES game, I imagine. Storing them on there, though, I imagine is going to be a, a different thing. You're not going to get too many on with that kind yeah, of Yeah, that, that was, I was going to say, you know, I was bigging it up a little bit there, but I was like, actually, are we only going to be able to fit like one or two games on this? But yeah. yeah. <laughs> is it going There's, to run Doom? <laughs> well, they're saying here at the moment that they're basically, um, it's got basic security, which is preventing the firmware from being dumped. Mm. So the thing is, he's probably got this one version hacked but he can't create a firmware yet. Okay. This is yet that can go out to all the other people. Now, the way that it works is the NES ROM actually gets dumped into the RAM Mm, and then people can play them. So the RAM's probably going to be really small, but maybe there'll be a way of having an external device or something that's just going to like have some custom firmware on it and flash the RAM every time you reset it. And you could put a new ROM on there or it can become a little kind of NES essentially. I mean, there have been other solutions, you know, for systems in the past where it's essentially like a a card where you reflash it with every game that you want to play. So I imagine maybe you can load the NES game via, you know, a laptop or something, just kind of send it down to the the game and watch every time you want to play something. It's, a bit it's like maybe. a race now, though, isn't it? It's like yeah. it's like you know, with piracy, when someone's like, "I've cracked that first. Now it's yeah. like I've hacked <laughs> the mini console first, and there must be guys sitting there waiting for these to come out, pre-ordered them just sitting there with all their tools ready to take it apart and completely destroy it. <laughs> and I think Joe's just uh, set out a challenge there to get Doom running on this thing. Yeah, I have. I mean, oh, that's yeah, that, that's, that's going to be Doom next. On it. <laughs> Is it, I think you can run Doom on a toothbrush now. It's on like everything. Yeah, so, I think we uh, covered it on a, uh, on a pregnancy <laughs> test, didn't we? <laughs> And there is actually a couple of demos. I think people have got it running on an NES, so I imagine it will be quite simple to get working on this thing. But if you're finding the games maybe a little bit too hard, because, you know, we were talking the other week actually about how you often, you know, play a game that you haven't played for a long time and you're like, God, how, how did I ever get so far on this back in the day? Well, there is actually a couple of hidden cheat modes inside the new Game & Watch as well. Yeah, this one made me laugh. So uh, I was reading this article and it was like, you know, the hidden secrets of the Nintendo Super Mario Bros. Game & Watch. And I was like, oh, wow, like there's going to be like a Konami code. Obviously, it's Nintendo, but it's going to be something along there in there. It's going to be really cool. 
But uh, apparently when you start up Super Mario Bros or Super Mario Bros last levels, hold the A button, it'll give you infinite lives. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's not too hard to find. So, but apparently if um, infinite lives isn't your thing, if you go to play the ball game on there and you don't want to play as Mario, hold the A button on there and you can play as Luigi as well, which I thought was pretty cool. I love the fact we've got a very Nemrude in Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting that they do put this stuff in though. Yeah. It's uh, really cool. And I, I reckon there might be more that get discovered in the future. Yeah. Um, maybe a nude Mario cheat or something. We'll <laughs> <laughs> Play as Lara Croft. Well, interesting you should say that. There is apparently 35 special events built into the digital clock as well. Um, the, the article here on Nintendo Life only lists off a couple of them. But if you boot it up at 7 o'clock in the morning or in the evening, uh, Monty Mole will appear from the ground and run around on the title screen. <laughs> um, at 11, pin- 11 minutes past 1, three bloopers appear and swim up um, and out of the screen. And at 5.55, the blocks turn into coins. On the- This is all on the uh, on the clock, sorry, not on the title screen. But apparently there's 35 of them in there, which is really cool. So yeah, there's a- quite a lot of Easter eggs to be discovered in, in-, in the little game and watch. You know, for-, for something which is meant to be just like a little, you know, oh, here's the new game and watch it plays Mario Bros kind of thing. It's quite. It's got quite a lot going on on it, I think. We've not heard about any um, micro, oh, what was it, Game Gear ones, have we? So No, yeah. that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's really true, actually. A little bit of a chip at Sega there. <laughs> yeah, you, you might have unlocked something on the uh, the mini Game Gear, but chances are you probably can't see it. Because it's <laughs> yeah, what have I unlocked? <laughs> Get the microscope. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, the fact that, that Nintendo didn't just dump a ROM on here and that's it, put it out. They've actually gone to the effort of putting some nice little secrets mm. in there for the fans. That's pretty cool, I think. So we'll put that. And of course, everything else we talked about this week, you'll find in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into our interview this week, talking about the Quill Classic Adventure Games with our guest, Tim Gilberts, he's coming up in just a moment. Let's give a huge thank you to another big supporter of the Retro Hour podcast. And this is our brilliant friends at Retro Gamer Magazine that, of course, is brought to you by the legendary Future Publishing. Now, at the moment, without getting too modern, a lot of the world is celebrating the the dawn of a new console generation. PlayStation 5 and Xbox X are out now as well. But Future Publishing are not only celebrating that, but also thanking those of us who still remember the original ones as well and showing them a bit of love. Now, we've got an amazing offer where you can subscribe to save 95 percent on the price and get three issues of retro gamer magazine for just one pound that's awesome how many people how many people have we had tweeting us going what are you going to be doing the yeah one yeah i've again? had so many people like <laughs> right when when have you got the deals back on and it's back on guys this is absolutely fantastic you can get free issues for a pound free now, this is exclusively for listeners of the Retro Hour podcast, and it's available actually on all the future magazines, um, gaming mags. Of course, Retro Gamer, but also official PlayStation, Edge, PC Gamer as well. And I'm looking actually at the latest edition of Retro Gamer magazine here. There's a massive cover feature on Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, which was a really good game, actually. I don't know if you guys ever played that back in oh, the day. Was that for the GameCube? Yeah, 2003, this one came out. So this was a lot of running on the walls. I remember that. Yeah, it it kind of took Prince of Persia in a different direction. And they've got um, Patrice Desile, I believe you pronounce his name, the guy who um, actually made that version, but also Jordan Mechner's in here too. So they're both kind of giving their input into the Prince of Persia franchise and that game in particular. And it's actually an eight page feature. And they talk about all the different Prince of Persia games over the years as well. Um, There's also. An interview here with um, Andrew Braybrook as well, talking about Gribbley's Day Out, um, Fire and Ice in here as well. There's loads of stuff. Turrican, they're talking about a lot of classic Amiga games that I love back in the day. Um, there's a look at the Gemini arcade system by Coleco, which I don't think I've ever seen one of those before. I've, n- I've never heard of the Gemini. And also, just looking at this as well, Edge magazine, I really need to read Edge because I know nothing about the modern consoles <laughs> and they've got a yeah. full look at the two new big consoles that have come out and I'm completely clueless. So <laughs> I need to check that out as well. well. That's the thing. A lot of people at the moment, like, should I buy a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox X? I mean, obviously Edge Magazine, very trusted name for many years now. So if you want to make up your mind, if you're going to be getting a new console, you can check that out as well. Now we've got this amazing offer. Get three issues of your favourite future publishing gaming magazine with this exclusive retro hour offer. And claim this now because you know, we get people tweeting us in like three or four months. Oh, I missed it. Make sure you do it right now. All you've got to do is head to this website, magazinesdirect.com forward slash 
Retro Hour. So that's saving up to 95% on official PlayStation Magazine, Retro Gamer, Edge or PC Gamer by heading to the website right now, magazinesdirect.com forward slash Retro Gamer and I'll put that in our show notes as well. Now, of course, we do have a patron. We're getting ready to record our uh, second episode, actually our, our third episode now, doing interviews for our patrons-only exclusive podcast. You guys are going to give me a bit of a grilling. Can't wait. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we're also going to be doing our patrons meetup, and if yep. you support us as well, for just as little as three fifty, you can get four episodes at the Retro Hour ad-free as well. Yeah, and you get them a bit early often. We, we put them out a few days early. So, um, And you get the bonus podcast. You get you know at least two of those a month. So if you want to back us on Patreon, you can do that at theretrohour.com. And of course, for doing it, you will get your place in the very prestigious Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week, thank you to Adam Ainsworth. Peter Van Holland. Andy Plucknett. Gavin Creech. Ben Leyland who all made donations into our Patreon. And if you'd like to do the same, we'd really appreciate your support. You'll find that at theretrohour.com. Right then, next, let's talk about classic adventure games with the author of The Quill and founder of Gilsoft. Tim Gilberts is our special guest next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Now, today, we're going to be talking about a topic that we've spent a lot of time talking about recently. Because we love it, and there are so many interesting stories around it, that is, of course, adventure games. And our guest this week was actually one of the pioneers in the adventure space here in Britain, um, a piece of software called The Quill that we're going to talk about in a bit more detail very soon, and some really interesting new projects that he's working on at the moment, including the Spectrum Next, and something that will blow your mind a really early system that we're going to talk about in a bit as well. But let's welcome on our guest this week. Welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, Tim Gilbert. Hello, Tim. Hi, yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Well, this is a real honour. Uh, I've uh, I, I listened to your show a lot, as uh, as you'll be aware. So uh, by accidentally clicking the button and showing I was listening to it earlier, trying to silence my iPhone. I'm not really good <laughs> with modern tech, so uh, let's see how we get on. <laughs> Oh, I really appreciate you coming on, Tim. I mean, you know, as you know, if you listen to the podcast, we always try and get a bit of your uh, geek credentials, kind of your background of, you know, where it all began. I mean, where did your journey with computers begin then? Ah, there's an interesting tale, that one. Um, I, I'm Obviously, my background is, uh, you know, in, in terms of my hobbies were electronics. I mean, you know, use, usual things like stamp collecting and everything else you do when you're a kid. But electronics yeah. was a really big part of my life because my dad was a, an engineer on British Telecom. So that's sort of that was baked into me, this interest in electronics. And we used to buy all the electronics magazines. Um, so obviously, being a bit asthmatic as well, the solder used to get at my chest a lot. Um, but we, you know, I persevered with. It. I loved loved playing with digital electronics. I did dabbled with radio amateurs and all the rest of it, and built myself a stereo. Um, obviously, so I could listen to my new meaty, beaty, big and bouncy album. Um, mm. And that was on the area, so I sort of well aware well, well of computing. And it was in a um, dad had a bit of side business as well, uh, building twenty four tune door chimes that used the TMS one thousand processor. So we, you know, it was it was certainly un, not unfamiliar territory to me. And I kept putting off getting a computer, which I think you mentioned. There's a few that were, were sort of published in the magazines, and I kept putting it off and kept putting it off. And then eventually, in the uh, school, the RE teacher, uh, Mister Danks, and the maths teacher, Mr. Arnold, they sort of started an after I was um, computing club and they had a ZX80, one of them had got a really early one and a, a TRS-80 the Mr. Danks had and, and they ran this sort of club. I think they were only about five pages ahead of us. I've mentioned this before um, in, in the book on Learning Basic and it, it really made me decide this is something I really want to do. Um, it was great fun. I, they even lent me the book from the ZX80 reader home and I, I got a chance to play with those. And that, that's really where it started plus i had access then as part of maths to the the school rml 480z 380z it was and and the online teleprinter to the to the icl mainframe at county hall of an evening if you stayed in school so that was my my first hands-on computing experiences i suppose well um schools when we kind of turned up at school it was a lot later so we had like the acorn machines that were bbc machines there previously yeah. you mentioned you had a teleprinter as well was that kind of connected to a network and was there what was educational computing like in the 70s in the uk 
Right. Well, I mean, in, in terms of access to our our um, computing, like I said, prior to this after school club, the only thing we had was this um, tally type um, connector with a big hand uh, acoustic modem. And that would you dial up, connect to the ICL mainframe at County Hall. Um, and you could basically, it was a, just a text interface for those who haven't used them. You, it was very, very slow, um, 110 board perhaps. So, you know, literally three or four characters on the screen at a, uh, you know, um, at a time. It's very, very poor performance. You couldn't do a lot. The main use for it was um, there's a, was an educational language called Cecil. Uh, and that will become important in a minute when we start chatting about where, where we started. Um, uh, computer education in schools, instruction language. And it's it's basically incredibly simplistic language. It's got like eight or nine statements. You can input a number, output a number, uh, jump if the number test is less. Um, I think you can add, and that's a bit. <laughs> but it, the idea was to teach children to, to, to code. So um, we had these like big coding sheets, and you'd write out your Cecil program, and they'd be sent off to be punched by uh, one of the punch operators at County Hall who'd submit all the kids' jobs. And uh, you, about a week later, you'd get like this 132 column blue, blue green line paper back with all the errors where you'd made a typing error, and they copied it exactly. So it was a really slow process. Um, the school did have this uh, RML 380Z in 79 when we were there, So, you, but it was very limited access and there was only one of them in this computer room. Um, and I had BASIC on it, so you could at least you know learn a little bit of BASIC. As I said, very few people had access to it, though, so educational computing was really these sort of sheets in the in the maths class to learn um, a little bit of programming. <laughs> was it was it kind of dependent on on the schools? So like you'd have certain techie schools and you'd have like non techie schools, and 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 the equipment would be depending on whether the school wanted to spend money on it or not. Oh, absolutely, hundred percent. I mean, the, you know, we—I was lucky. Our school had even had an, an RML three eighty Z. You know, um, they didn't offer any computing courses at all. Like I said, because I was in the um, the the maths was streamed then. Of course, you had M one, M two, M three, and um, I was because I was in the M one class. We got this opportunity that the, the teachers took it on themselves to do to sort of provide this sort of extra thing for the for the kids. So, you know, they, when I actually went on and wanted to do uh, to my A levels to do computing, I had to. Do at the local college um and they had a bit more facilities obviously they had um again another you know, very unusual uh, british computer the alpha micro um that was a sort of multi-user system that had uh, about four vdu terminals and a couple of teletypes in the computer room it was in the room behind big, two big eight inch floppy disks um and that ran you could do assembler and basic on that um, so they had a little bit more facilities there at the college, but they didn't have a huge range of computers available, but they were teaching A-level computing, obviously. I mean, you have to remember at this time, the, the sort of physics course I was doing at O-level was still valves, <laughs> thermionic emission. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, So we, we really are talking... You know, I, I think, in fact, I, I, I'd had to go with a physics teacher about the fact we weren't learning transistors, which obviously I was a big hobbyist. Um, and I actually did one of the classes for the, the students to see the difference between transistors and, and thermionic valves. So uh, that was a bit of fun. <laughs> so, you know, it was very early days, very early days. I love the fact that you had teletypes as well, because there's just something so, like, industrial about teletypes. That, oh. The last one I played with was the, um, they had one at the Leicester Retro Computer Museum set so up. so noisy, the, aren't they? Oh, they, were, <laughs> they, were, they were running. They were actually running a text adventure on it, and yeah. it would just print out line by line. It was yeah. amazing to watch. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, if you were the last one into the computer lab at the college, you had the two teletypes on the end. Um, and, and basically, like you said, it was great. It was great for a text adventure, though, you know? <laughs> and ideal for <laughs> line editing is hard work when you can't see what you're, what you're doing. We're, just, we're so ruined today, you know? But it's uh, it's great. And I've still got my little paper tape printout that I, I would have because, of course, the only way to save your program would be to stream it onto the teletype. So you actually wanted a teletype terminal if you wanted to save your program off because you'd want to print it onto the, the uh, paper tapes so you could take it away with you and then put it back in when you come back otherwise you'd have to try and invest in an eight inch floppy and get it inserted in a system drive by someone so uh, um, i wasn't very popular in college because i i worked out to put up false login prompts so i could steal the admin password so i could change <laughs> uh, but nice. maybe, maybe i should admit to that <laughs> and you, you accidentally left it on one weekend as well right oh that was the school one yeah or oh, tell me about it um because uh, we i was allowed access to the to the to the room i was staying late one friday night uh, obviously using this terminal and i you, you dial up you put the modem on it makes the phone call and obviously you work on it and then you hang up and, and you well i i went home and i 
by the time I got home, I thought, oh, crumbs, I didn't ring it up. And this is Friday night. So I had to ring the school in a mad panic, get all of the, uh, um, the caretaker at the time. And uh, he, he was, I was able to talk him through going in the room and then hooking the modem and disconnecting it. I tried to think what a phone bill would have been on Monday, but that would have been the end <laughs> of my computing career in the school, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving into your home life then, what was your first system that you got at home and how did you convince your parents to get it for you? Ah, right. Um, that was in 1981 and it was a ZX81, of course. Um, I didn't have to persuade my parents very hard to help me do things. Um, I had um, a job delivering um, bingo cards um, on a for a, the Jane Hodge home. So it was like, um, basically it was, you take the, there was loads and loads of people. They had a, a big list and round you, you traipse the streets, pushing these, these uh, bingo cards pre in um, national lottery days, of course. And uh, it was quite lucrative at times, especially around Christmas where, you know, loads of um, people would, you know, very often, I think it was the only person they'd see some of the older people, you know, I call on the door with the bingo card, they do it and you win money. And um, I, so I used to do all right with tips and things. So I was, I was able to raise a little bit of cash for my electronics hobby. So when I said, you know, I want to get, we'd been, I'd been saving for a ZX80 since I'd uh, seen the one, I think, you know, I could afford it because I pre, Previously looked at the the one that Science of Cambridge did, which is the MK14. Um, we we'll probably talk about that later, but that, I looked at that in the magazine and thought I could afford that. It was fifty odd pound for the kit, and then the ZX80 had come out, and it was obviously just a hundred pounds, and it was a much better computer with a screen display and a proper keyboard. Um, I use the term proper keyboard loosely, of course, for those who know the machine. Um, but it was basically a real machine, so I'd been saving for that ZX80, and then the ZX81 was announced, and I got quite a bit of money, and Dad agreed to put the other half with it, and uh, we sent off for the kit and built it, and of course, it didn't work. <laughs> Typical, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, you know, we we rang so we rang uh, Kate Sinclair as they were then, and uh, they said, "Can you put your finger on the big chip, the ULA chip?" And I said, "No, it burns my finger." He said, "That's working all right then." Um, it must be something else. So we, we sent it back to him and there was an agonising few weeks wait while well, I had just had a manual to read and uh, came back with a, apparently it was a faulty Z80 chip in it and they'd swapped it for me. So uh, it wasn't that mod my fault. They were a great company, but it was, yeah, their quality control wasn't always the highest standard, no. I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, building it from a kit, you know, was pretty much the end of, that was the end of the era, wasn't it? They were the last people to offer it. I think um, Acorn tell a story that they, they stopped selling the Atom as a kit uh, went you know, the final last straw was they had one in the way someone had uh, decided they didn't want to use a uh, soldier and iron on it because it would uh, they didn't think the heat would do it any good so they'd sellotaped all the components in <laughs> and send it back because it didn't work so I, I <laughs> you know I think that was that's the, the sort of tail end of the kit era for computing and, and that's reality is Sinclair turned into a, a you know an achievable reality for everybody in you know and Acorn did it in in the educational stream and for other people as well with the Electron and the BBC they they made home computing that between the two you know much as the rivalry is there between the two of them they created an entire world of people who who had access to machinery that was really locked in those little rooms at the school and the college that were accessible only to the to the, to the few before you, you mentioned uh, the language Cecil earlier yeah how, how did that help you get into programming? And what was it? Because I, I've never heard anybody mention Cecil before out of all of our guests. No, it's probably completely lost. I think it was, um, we've, there's a, there's a couple of us who've sort of reminisced about the product because we think it might have been only authorities who bought ICL mainframes. We think it was probably a job submission system that was provided on the, on the ICL mainframe. So only education authorities who had that mainframe would have that service available if they loaded it. And of course, only schools that wanted to take it would have used it. Um, so of course, the, we had this thing with all the coding sheets. Um, and like I said, very simple set of instructions, almost like an assembly language, but interpreted by the ICL mainframe to, to just to give you the bare minimum you needed to understand how a, a computer worked. Um, and it was a lot of work for kids to, to try this and send them out. So, uh, like I said, uh, uh, Mr. Danks was the RE teacher and also taught maths, and he had a TRS-80. And um, we were saying it'd be great if we could have a Cecil interpreter on that so you could just type it in and run the program straight away and see the output rather than having to wait for the typing to be done and the run to be done on the, the mainframe and then come back a week later. And it'd be much more interactive for kids in the class to, to see it done. So... Um, I said, oh, I reckon I'm I, good enough to I'd have a go at that. I wouldn't mind trying to write one. You know, I think we could do that in basic. So he lent me his TRS-80 to take home. 
um, which was great. And uh, I, I had that for a few weeks, and I, I wrote a Cecil interpreter in TRS-80 Basic, you know, the book were open on one side and knowing the language, and, and that's how it really was probably my first unpaid commercial programming job. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously you've got this ZX81 at home then. Um, and I mean, you'd, you're obviously playing 3D Monster Maze, like everyone did. Absolutely. What, what, <laughs> what else were you doing on there then? What, what got you into programming it? Um, well, I, um, my, I was still in school, actually. I've split my time between college and school. So um, my technology project for it was um, based around using the ZX81. Uh, there was an article in Personal Computer World, I think, called... Uh, uh, controlling a nuclear power station with the ZX81 or something like that. I've got a copy of the article somewhere. Uh, um, basically, it was just about how do you interface computers to the real world? Because obviously, I, I, much as I loved the fact I could use the computers without um, soldering, I, I still loved electronics as well. So this was an ideal opportunity to do a project that was both things at the same time. So I... Um, as part of the project, we uh, a friend of mine, uh, we was one of these, you know, you got to work with a colleague on a um, on a project and present a final report. We sort of researched what um, machines were available for output from computers, and we came up with a, a chart recorder that would be something we could build ourselves and interface to, Mark, to the ZX eighty one, and that's what we did as our as our uh, final technology project. We uh, we built this uh, Arrow Meccano with a main stepper motor. Thinking back, the safety issues must have been horrendous, really. But um, it was connect hooked up. I bought um, um, a kit, I think, from Maplins. That was a little um, I/O card for the ZX81, which you, you know, you had to do some pokes and, and peaks to create a bit of assembly language in order to access the I/O ports on the ZX81. Um, so by now, I was having to learn a bit of assembly language. Tried writing some stuff in Basic to control it, and couldn't get it very accurate. So pretty much had to learn assembly language to make it faster. Learned that from the back of the ZX81 manual and a copy of eventually invested in was the Rodney Zacks programming book for Z80 and really just literally hand, like we'd done with uh, probably the Cecil education was a good one. You know, it, it hand assembling, writing out the uh, same, putting the hex codes next to it, working those out in decimal, poking them into memory and, and running them. So, uh, you know, that education had already stood me in good stead to move forward on assembly language. So that was that was really what, what drove it was that, project i suppose in school and writing little games like making space invaders and you know there wasn't a lot of software to buy for the zx81 i had a few um, tape i only had a 1k memory to start with um eventually invested in a 16k memory pack and uh, there was i think eventually we managed to get um uh, an assembler for it as well monitor at first but uh, then an assembler um so you could type it in as a you know mnemonic codes so you didn't have to remember every every code and hand us especially jumps i could never get re- jumps right in assembly language i don't know if you know the way it works but mm. i could never get jumps right always always struggled with them because you have to use um a number obviously between one and 255 zero and 255 but the numbers above 128 are negative numbers really to his compliment i could never get the reverse numbers right so i always have to have to put like four zeros in which are not instructions which means do nothing and have a number that was slightly bigger than it needed to be because i knew i'd get somewhere behind that instruction and land somewhere i never could work out exactly so once i got an assembler it'd be brilliant i'm sure the <laughs> considering i was in the m1 it would be embarrassing but uh it did work <laughs> which is why if you ever look at any of my old code there'll be a couple of knops and you don't know why <laughs> that, that article you mentioned sounded interesting as well. The uh, running a nuclear power station off a ZX81. You wouldn't want a ram pack wobble in that scenario. No, you? absolutely not. You really, <laughs> really wouldn't. I would certainly not have chanced it. But it was a very capable machine. You know, if you, mm. it just had everything you needed. It was a proper computer. There's no two ways about it. And with a couple of electronics hooked onto it, it was the Arduino of its time. You know, if you wanted yeah. to use it that way, there's there's no two ways about it. As had been its predecessors, the, you know, the you know, and that was the market, the Science of Cambridge that that predated Sinclair were selling to with their MK14. You know, they were they were selling to this sort of electronics crossover enthusiast area, and I think, don't think it was any accident that the MK14 was was advertised in Practical Wireless rather than in an electronics magazine. They knew the market they would be hitting would be people converting from from radio. I mean, the electronics was a, an emergent thing in the 70s you know prior to that there was only radio you didn't have electronics enthusiasts you had radio enthusiasts so uh, again it was a symptom of that and i think clive was quite clever in, in his uh, letting uh, chris 
put that in, in practical wireless. A whole area that had never really had anything to do with computing was suddenly introduced to a, a machine that they could get into. So, you know, there was the early stages were, were driven by, by that company. They, they really did. Well, what, what software titles really stood out to you? And were you playing stuff like Scott Adams games? And w- what did you want to emulate? Right. Um, I suppose the... The, the games that in terms of adventure games, my my first contact, obviously on the, the alpha, I you know I had probably had a crack at um, Colossal Cave um, in college, but you would have had limited time to access that. Um, on the ZX81, obviously it was the Arctic Adventures, which should, would have been uh, Planet of Death and those uh, those games. They were the ones that were the first contact with adventure games on the ZX81. Um, I didn't really get into adventure gaming until the uh, the Spectrum. Um, and that was sort of Abasoft's uh, really chance to play Colossal Cave, you know, at home. In terms of the uh, the Scott Adams ones, I had very little contact with it because Adventureland obviously came out on the the, the Spectrum, uh, but I didn't really get a copy of that until actually quite recently. I bought a copy a couple of years ago to play it. So uh, that area of, electronic, of, of, of of Scott Adams' work completely escaped me um, purely because I didn't have those sort of machines to access it. You know, it was very much produced on the um, the Apples and the the, uh, the other machines. It, it came to the to, to the Sinclairs much later, <clears throat> certainly the Spectrum side. So um, Infocom ones definitely by 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 the time the you know Infocom had come around, I had a Commodore sixty four. You know, we were already. Uh, um, sort of trading as a company by then so I had access to more machines and and that access to disk drives opened up some of those uh, gaming areas that were just closed to tape based systems so in terms of adventures the arctic ones were definitely the ones that got me into uh, into text adventures and, and why I actually knew what they were when Graham wandered down the, the path which I'm sure we'll come on to well like many other kind of Britsoft companies you started your own software house Gilsoft uh but uniquely, you were quite young. How old were you when you actually started Gilsoft? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, probably 16, I would have thought. Yeah, it would have been 1981, late 81, that we started selling Cecil, which is probably where it became a commercial thing of selling it. Um, so, yeah, that would have been 16, I suppose. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're quite quite young. <laughs> Um, it just seemed a natural progression. Like I said, Dad always had a bit of a side hobby. We were selling these um, doorbells. You know, any any poor salesman who came to the door you'd to try and sell anything usually went away with a pack of 10 of them as a sale or return to try and sell to other people they called at the door of. I was in the <laughs> attic soldering them together. So there was always a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit from my dad, and I think he saw the opportunity to make some money on the, the software as well, You know, probably more so than I did. It was just for writing it, really. So, like you say, I had all the classic games, obviously, on the, the ZX81, never left my site, but I was more into the programming and the creation than playing the games. Although, you know, obviously I had a real copy of Monster Maze, everyone did. Um, I'd actually seen that sort of 3D game much earlier, which had inspired the, what computers could achieve. There was a computer that the Electronics Today International published called the Triton, and that actually had a, um, a basic 3D game on it. That they published the pictures in the magazines. And I was just amazed that computers might be able to do that sort of thing. So when you saw it on the ZX81, you were just blown away by the graphics. And it was amazing. I mean, it's hard for anybody today who, who's used to modern graphics to understand what a, um, an, a moment it was to see that 3D graphics could be done on a computer in the late 70s. And then that, you know, you could have one in your house that played this game loaded from a cassette yeah. tape. You know, it's just unbelievable. And and I still jump when, when Rex gets me. <laughs> it's a great one. So uh, I, th- I think that is pretty, it's probably the most terrifying video game character, I think. Yeah. Because it's that, it's that sense of, you know, you know he's coming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the little messages that pop up on the screen. Yeah, as well. yeah. Oh, yeah it's, it's, it's what <laughs> Aliens tapped into, isn't it? It's the, yeah. unseen, it's the unseen threat. And the end, when you see it at the last second, it is quite a terrifying bit of graphic. And those teeth <laughs> at that me. angle, it's, it's just terrifying. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's a good game. It's a good game. So there's no two ways about it. But Mazogs was another favourite of mine on the ZX81 as well. I loved that game. That was really clever. And that's probably moving more into the sort of, you know, exploring, get the sword, move around, definitely sort of onto the adventure side of it, I think, but graphical adventure rather than text, you know. So, and you're also um, poking around with code and Kempston joysticks. Um, what's the story there and how did that help the company grow? Oh, right. Well, that was um, that was sort of a, a bit of a double-edged sword. That was how I ended up leaving school, of course, early. Because um, obviously we were, I was programming fairly heavily, and uh, he 
I bought a couple of games, Penetrator, um, Horace Go Skiing, and a few others for the Spectrum in the early days. And, of course, you couldn't use the Kempston joystick with it, which I bought. And um, I was thinking, oh, how, you know, why, why can't I use the Kempston joystick with these? And um, I was quite into sort of having a little look at cracking the games. And uh, I just got in, involved one Friday afternoon and, and sort of thought, well, I, maybe I can adapt it to make the, the, the joystick work instead of the keyboard. And uh, I just spent all weekend, you know, the typical programmer in the flow, um, early hours of Saturday morning, 7 a.m., still tired, get, get an hour's sleep, have another go at it, keep going all weekend. And by the end of the weekend, I'd adapted about six games. Um, I can't remember what they all were, um, to be able to use a joystick. And the way I did it was you had a little program that you loaded first and then you loaded the main game tape and it st- say stayed in memory somewhere safe, then patched the way the keyboard was read so you could use the joystick. And uh, you could play those games with joysticks. So um, we added that to the repertoire of Gilsoft sales and uh, called it Softlink. Um, and it sold quite well, actually, enough to came to the notice of Kempston pretty quickly. And uh, they asked whether they could um, sell it with the joystick. Um, you know, came to an arrangement and they said, you know, we'll buy all your existing stocks so or it's not available from anyone else. And I think I've told this tale to other people, you know, dad, quick as a flash, they said, how many copies you got? They said, oh, 200. So they bought them off as a retail value. Um, it literally took us a whole week to make those 200 stock. <laughs> <laughs> Good job we didn't say two thousand. Yeah, no, I was thinking that actually, but you know, it was a really, it was quite a lucrative little deal. You know, I mean, it's a couple of thousand yeah. pounds for a weekend's work. Um, you know, I can't remember the exact figure now; it's lost in the midst of time. But I think we did some others, and they took the idea and did a few more until the software houses got into including joystick support for for the games. But like I said, that that really that weekend, that Monday morning, I got summoned to the school and. Uh, discussed perhaps about my attendance they they sort of cottoned on as well that I wasn't always spending my time at college because of course I was splitting my A-level time between college and the school and they sort of cottoned on that I wasn't really attending um, the college when I wasn't in school that maybe I was going home and programming and by then we were we were turning over some money on the the, the, the Gilsoft so it was uh, uh, they, they sort of said this wasn't conducive to the to the school's ethos and I said it wasn't conducive to me staying and I walked out to the cheers of applause of the uh, sixth form who happened to have the uh-huh. uh, open door next to the sixth form tutor's office but probably the one of the worst decisions of my life but also the best because um, obviously I went full-time with Gilsoft then I, I kept up the college bit with the, the, uh, the computing but uh, I jacked the school in and uh, in on reflection it was uh, you know the usual teenage uh, brash but my dad was very mm-hmm. supportive said if that's what you want to do and we you know we, we we'll, we'll make it work somehow so uh, you know it, it really got us off onto a, a full-time programmer for the company then and you know it was a real family business as well I mean was it just you and your dad or did you like rope in other family members and get friends <laughs> helping out everybody everybody the early the early covers were drawn by friends from school Steve Harbron um, you know they uh, Hugh Jones did a lot of the uh, loading graphics we did um, my mum did all the secretarial and admin work um, as we got bigger uh, we roped in my aunt to do the um, packing and, and my my uncle and my cousin uh, did the accounts for us as you know obviously we had been qualified accountants um, you know, I have another friend Andy Morton did a lot of the testing with us and helped us to, to do just to do the coding um we you know it was, there's no end i'd be struggling to remember everybody i suppose but uh yeah we we're hoping anybody we could so the, the early artwork was certainly done by school friends in the art class and you know it's it, they, they were really good for the for the for what they provided for us and you know they 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 got us off the ground as well so yeah we roped in anybody we could find really to to, to keep the business moving well, you also created a, a game called Munchman, um, very similar to a, a, a round friend that we know. <laughs> yeah. um, what did Atari have to say about this? Um, all I remember was the Atari headed letter and the sudden destruction of all copies and the, uh, and, and, well, that was a bit of a bad move on it. I had actually been brought up on copyright issues as, um, in, in school as well once because we used to produce a little school magazine, an underground one, and, of course, I was nicking um uh, cartoons from from newspapers and, and magazines and reprinting them as part of the underground magazine so i had all, i was a sort of aware of the the um the sort of copyright issues and uh 
I, it wasn't a surprise that we we got pinned down. I think it was just a bit of early enthusiasm to get an advert out. I'd written the Munchman clone, um, you know, we'd, uh, as, as part of the effort. So it was included in the, the things we initially put in the advert, but we re-pulled the advert pretty quick and stopped doing that. And I think it was the last brush we ever had with it. But uh, and, uh, and looking back on it, it was probably a bad move in the first place, but because uh, it was pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> Which it was recently rediscovered though and uh, we found out I did find an original copy in the attic and uh, one of the guys from Crash managed to, to recover it for us and uh, it was um, there was a little news item in the Crash uh, annual the year before last on its recovery so uh, I thought it had been lost to time but uh, there we go we, I finally got to see it running again so uh, I don't think Atari had too much to worry about really. I, I think copyright didn't exist back then until you copied something big <laughs> yes absolutely so luckily enough we we, we learned our lesson early. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, though, because obviously you had, like, Jelly Monsters on the Vic-20 and yeah. there was a Snapper yeah. on the BBC Micro and the Electron. I think if you just change just enough of it, you could get away with it, but it must have been a very fine line. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think describing as Munchman and describing the dot, probably the description in the advert was pretty much a giveaway, wasn't it? Well, what was your first commercial game then, and how did you go about selling it back then? Um, it was uh, 3D Maze of Gold, which is obviously inspired by um, talking about copyright. It was obviously inspired by uh, Monster Maze to an extent, but it was also inspired by this program I'd seen on the Triton before. Um, so there's, um, that was the one really that I was quite proud of because it used a little bit of a trick for the spectrum to give you like a real time walk through the maze uh, and that was done by using just updating the attributes rather than the actual graphics for anyone who knows the spectrum well enough there's quite a high resolution 6000 pixel screen but then the, the the colors can only be done on this which gives the classic color clash it can only be done on this 24 by 32 grid of colors so by basically pre-drawing the, the maze on the, the, the 3D view on the screen. I just coloured in the blocks in the, the 24 by 32 coloured blocks to change the, 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 the walls and the tie. I was really proud of that at the time. I'd come up with this idea and it was uh, it turned into a game. You, know, you have to collect uh, collect gold bars before they're valued and they devalue to find the maze. So it was a, uh, I was it was more the technical trick that led to the game, but uh, that was that was the, really the first one that said we could probably make some money on this, and that was pretty shortly after the Spectrum was launched because uh, I was at the um, the one of the mic it was a micro fair in um, London when it was launched, when the Spectrum was launched, and I phoned my dad and said, look, this is the machine that we could really write software to make money on, I think. We need to get one quickly. And I think he actually rang Sinclair while I was at the show with his his access card and ordered one. Obviously, they took months to arrive. Um, it was The show was in April, I think, of 82. So we had ours by about June, July. So we were pretty lucky, really, to get it fairly early. But I'd already spent everything, like read everything I could on it and done some routines on the ZX81. Um, and I come up with this idea. And so we did Munchman, we did the 3D Maze of Gold. We had a, um, a version that used a similar attribute update of um, the Life Simulation, the Cellular Automata. Um, mm. That was another one that was included in the advert. I can't remember what the fourth one was. Oh, Cecil, probably, <laughs> as the educational language. So um, that was the one, and I think it was in Your Computing in 90, October 1982-ish, which would have come out in the September. We put a, um, an eighth-page ad in there, which would stand out. Um, and sort of that was it. That was the, that was the commercial launch, really, of Gilsoft in, in, at that time, I think. But I think we, we, we also did a few computer shows as well. There was one in Bristol and one in Cardiff, and we had to stand there and sold the software that way as well. So any, any route we could find, you know. Um, I think we... You know, we, we, we pretty much did that. That was the, in the early days of everybody. It was by mail order in the back of the magazines because that's all there was. You know, it's you know, if you look at that particular issue of, of um, uh, your computing, there was very few adverts for Spectrum software in there, just a handful, you know, and we were one of the, we were one of the first in there. Well, arcade-style games were hugely popular there. Why did you choose to focus on adventure games and where did the idea of the quill come from? And... Um, mm -hmm. Please explain it for people who might not actually know what the quill is. Yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, uh, arcade games. Well, uh, I love playing arcade games, but I probably didn't think I was a good enough um, <laughs> uh, coder to write one. Uh, I did have a crack, um, but it was more a technical demonstration I could do it, and it never got sold through Gilsoft. It got sold through another company because um, it really wasn't that good. <laughs> but it proved I could do sprites and animation and, and things like that. But by then, um, the 
Graham had walked down the uh, the drive because we were obviously operating out of uh, you know Gilsoft headquarters at this time was Thirty Hawthorne Road, which is the family home. Um, so we had a desk in the in in the front bedroom, which was my bedroom, and uh, he just some this guy comes sauntering down the the drive. Now I'd only ever seen black and white photographs of Clive Sinclair, so I didn't know we had ginger hair at the time. Um, so this guy walks down looking very much like Clive Sinclair, but with black hair. And I thought, crumbs, Clive Sinclair's arrived at the house because I'm looking out of my bedroom window. And the doorbell goes, and uh, it's, it's Graham Yandel. And uh, he's seen the advert for Sinclair software, uh, Spectrum software. He thought he'd, come, he'd like to come and see it first before he bought it. Of course, she didn't have a shop you could go and buy too. So he said, oh, fine. So he came up and uh, he he must have been impressed because uh, he apparently he did buy some software, I think made of gold, uh, and went away. But it, as a sort of parting thing, he said, um, I've been writing some uh, computer adventure games as well for, for the Spectrum. I said, oh, have you? He said, yeah, I, I got this one, Mag- Magic Castle. I said, oh, I'd really like to see that. You know, maybe we could maybe we could sell it if it's any good. And he said, oh, OK. So he supplied me with a copy of this this game. And um, I was brilliant, but it came with, and uh, what he'd had was um, a method to write computer adventure games for the Spectrum much more simply. And and the reality is any kind of game in BASIC is going to be quite slow and going to struggle. Um, and this one allowed you to write an assembly language. And, and he'd, uh, he'd based it on an article in um, Practical Computing in 1980 by a guy called Ken Reed, which had suggested having a, uh, an interpreter now, an interpreter is a way of, it's pretty much a language specifically for adventure games, um, which is focused around the sort of things that happen in a game, which is to find a verb or a noun, because most early games were only verb and noun. And you you would match whether the person had typed in a verb or a noun by looking it up in a, in a table called a vocabulary. And it would allocate the word to be in either a verb or a noun and give it a number and so for the two numbers would match you had that specific verb and that noun like go south or take axe and if those matched then you'd have a list of things to do when those two words were matched and the list of things might be to check whether you're at a particular location and did you have a particular object you know and if those things happened then the action would be taken to either set a flag to do something later in the game or to to print a message out to say you've just died of drinking the poison or whatever you needed to do so it was a very simple language it could simply be at one so you're at location one and if the verb and noun had drink put drink glass and is um is the glass poison yes message you die end so it's very simple to create um the sort of things and activities that happen in an adventure game um, there's a bit more complexity, obviously, but that's the basis of it. So he created this method to do it, which was basically, um, for those who know assembly language, was a database. Um, and you had to hand code the database in an assembler, but you could assemble the database and then just stitch it onto the interpreter and it would run it. A bit like typing it in, if you're typing in a basic program, I suppose, just a lot more convoluted. So I had a crack at this to write my own game as well, which we call, was called Diamond Trail. And I thoroughly enjoyed writing my own adventure game, um, but the method was quite cumbersome. There's no two ways about it. Um, and we, we got chatting. We've become quite firm friends by now. And uh, I'd even joined his um, uh, gaming group he was a member of, so to play Dungeons & Dragons. Um, so we we had this sort of discussion back and forth. And I said, what would be really nice is if you could we could do something with this method that it was easy for everybody else to use so that you didn't have to know how to do programming or use an assembler. Um, you could just literally type in those things and it would run a bit like using basic. That's, um, that's it. Exactly. Like I, I think before, you know, a lot of titles were coming out that were full games, but this was a game creation game. And absolutely nowadays you get stuff like people making versions of games on the unreal engine that they're creating it on um lots of different systems there's an internal playstation one called dreams but this was yep. really really early on and uh was mm-hmm. there a, a, an excitement around it from users to be able to actually create their own experiences but a lot easier than having to learn all of that 
Oh, absolutely. It absolutely exploded onto the scene. I mean, it took us from a, a little backroom operation. You know, the Quill really was what launched us into a, into being a, a proper software house. You know, we had to red premises. Um, the money started coming in, you know, and, and it was, it, it really changed us from being a little back bedroom operation into being a proper company because it, it got really good reviews. It sold well. And I don't think there was anything on the market like it at all, you know, nothing. Um, several other types of things came out later, obviously, but I really genuinely think it was the first one available commercially. Subsequent research has turned up a few attempts by people to have done something similar in the past, um, but then they, you know, they, they never really hit the mainstream for one reason or another because they were on limited environments. Perhaps, as I said, in the early, in the late 70s, you know, computing was very much. Uh, limited to a very small circle of people and it was it was this sort of perfect cauldron of the spectrum making the world making computing popular selling in their millions uh, meant there was a market for software and there was a market for people to to create their own things and a lot of people a lot of people love creating things um but i, I don't know about you but if i want to drill a hole i don't build an electric drill first to drill one i go to the shop and buy one so, yeah. and that's the perfect example, you know, if you want to write a story, you can pick a pen up and use a bit of paper. A lot of people invested in a typewriter to do it. But, you know, the reality is you don't need that complex a tool to write a story, but you do in order to be able to program a computer adventure game. And you do to be able to write an arcade game as well. And, and that's why tools like um, Arcade Game Designer have become so popular over the years and things like the Unity. And these are tools that take all the, the hard grunt work out of writing a, a game and put it in the, the creativity back into the hands of the people who just want to create. You know, we, we're using... Um, Zencaster as an online, we didn't we didn't have to write any of this. It gives us the ability to to record a radio a quality podcast or radio show without having to to invest all the, the you know do it all from the ground up. And at least mm. we, we 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 stand on other people's shoulders. We really do. And that they, these sort of tools allow you to do that. I think you make a really good point there. Because you know, naively, when I was about like seven or eight years old, I remember. Um, my friend Gary and I, you know, at school on the BBC Micros, were convinced that we could, we, we had this, you know, great story ideas. We could write a text adventure game and we tried to do the whole thing in basic and the amount of things, you know, because you didn't know where the player was going to go next and what they'd choose to pick up and like it, the whole thing just fell apart, <laughs> you know, not having an interpreter. We naively believed it would be so simple to do. Yeah, yeah I, I think there's also an element of, um, in, in the text adventure that you you want to be able to deal with lots of scenarios in one go and you can. And and, and I think, don't knock your attempts. You, you probably would have found what you did was you probably tried to shoot too high. Most people yeah. do when they create something, they try to make the best they can straight away. And and that's that's not always the the easiest thing because like you say you suddenly the level of complexity becomes massive, and you've got to account for every possible scenario. So uh, you know some of my favourite games take place in one room. <laughs> Were there any complications with like different versions and translations and different platforms? Oh yeah, crumbs crumbs became a full time industry moving across different platforms, and and obviously it was the Commodore sixty four was the next target. That conversion the to the six five zero two was actually done by Graham. It was the next, obviously, biggest selling platform for us. Um, the, the difficulty was trying to work out which platforms were worth targeting and would sell well. Um, you know, we we obviously the, the number of machines at the time was massive. Even before we had the Quill, one of the first things we did I, was obviously try and convert the interpreter to other machines um so i did a translation to the dragon 32 uh, which never got finished i was i learned my lesson about backups on that machine by typing it all in all in one fell swoop one afternoon and then when i went to it save the dragon locked up and i lost it I lost oh, it. Nightmare. yeah absolutely i learned about backups very early on in my career um and again it was laziness because i'd been hand code transcoding it and i just thought oh, i can do this by just by hand uh, skipping steps never a good one so um, C64 obviously was the next big one. Uh, by Before the 64, we'd done the Illustrator as well, which is the graphics add-on to it. Um, I think it was about the same time. So I was working on that when Graham did the 6502 conversion. Uh, very talented coder, Graham. There's still two ways about it. But we, we also did, we were pushed into doing a version for the Auric. Um, we had a, a visit from a nice Mr. Bruce Everest in his, uh, his posh BMW in his coat, um, telling us it was going to be the next big machine and we should uh, we should definitely get a, a version of Quill for the, that. So uh, I spent quite a few months developing a version of Quill for the Auric um, 
uh, Atmos and Auric, uh, Auric One. Oh, which is great. I, I, I love the machines. They're great. They really are nice little machines for those who haven't played with them. But uh, um, I don't think he was quite telling the truth. It was going to be the next big thing in the uh, in the country somehow. <laughs> I don't think we <laughs> sold too many of those. Um, we also had um, someone engaged to do a QL version because obviously we'd uh, we'd been asked by Sinclair to nip up to Cambridge to see their top secret project. And there's all these people sat on the train with their big jiffy bags, not talking to each other, all knowing what's in each other's bags, but haven't signed an NDA that would make you cry um we couldn't really talk about it so we'd uh, we'd got somebody another local guy from barry to write a um a conversion to the ql for us but i think you know it was starting to explode now so we had interest from overseas we had um uh, a norwegian company look to do a scan to get the scandinavian rights and do translations into into other languages so we did a b version of the the product it was all called a quill a up to version a06 i think we had um because we did obviously found bugs we issued new ones and that was a service we offered because it's, it's a utility software if we've got a problem you've got to got to allow people to be able to get a fixed version from you but we did these sort of b series which were designed to be translated easily so something we'd missed in the a series a couple of the messages were always built in which you can tell the early quill games because you know um the do you want to play again messages are all fixed and that was something we sort of missed the trick on really we should have made that customizable so we did in the b series and then there was another version in english for c is called the c series which allowed you to do that in, in english um so that was quite a big deal as well with uh with the norwegian version translated into that and there were sniffs from america as well from a company called code writer corporation and they wanted to do um ones for the apple um and we they wanted an atari version and i converted the uh Commodore 64 version to the atari uh 400 800 um, for, and we gave them the source code then to do the Apple version rather than them doing it, us uh, doing it for them, I think. Uh, I'm trying to think what else we did. We recently discovered they, they did an IBM version as well, which we didn't know existed. <laughs> wow. So there's an IBM PC version. They must have completely written, written that separate to us because obviously Graham had uh, written, um, by this time, had switched to a, um, and a compiler method on with, with CPM and the IBM computer. We did we offered a version that, that ran as a, as a compiler. Still had the interpreter, but instead of an editor, you, you actually wrote it as a bit of source code, a bit more like a programming tool and, and compiled the game. I, I am pleased to hear that you did a Sinclair QL port because I actually got my hands on a, a QL recently and uh, I haven't got much to run on it, so I'll have to, have to track that down. <laughs> yeah, no right. problem. I don't think it's available online. Drop, drop me a message. Right, I'll, okay. I'll send you a copy. It's not a problem. We've only, oh, great. Yeah, no it, Dragon32 port? Uh, not of Quill. We we have. I've got, and it's a long term project. And the Dragon community, you'll will know. I'm. I keep promising to do it. And I've, I've uh, the Dragon user. Uh, um, uh, there's still an active uh, Dragon community, and we had a, a day at the uh, Computer Museum about two years. I did. I did tease a, a version of the interpreter running. So I, it's one of my little retro projects. I need to go back because I've actually got the stickers for the cassette tapes for Diamond Trail and Magic Castle for the Dragon. We got as far as producing the, the cassette labels and everything um we just never actually finished the, the port and obviously by then the, the poor old dragon the uh, the welsh computer sort of uh, was was already being discontinued by then so uh, we we didn't didn't pursue it it was actually used as our office machine though we had a sakosha um dot matrix uh, printer which was used to print a lot of the uh, the documentation so if you've got any very early versions of our software it will have been printed on our sakosha on the dragon um, no, no word processor on it. I taught my mum how to do ten print, and then in putting quotes what she wanted to say. Um, so she was uh, basically a word processor was the basic editor with print statements on it. <laughs> wow! Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you needs must in the early technologies. Yeah, you? exactly. <laughs> and he had a proper keyboard, which was actually usable. It was a lovely machine. So when you started receiving titles that were made on the Quill, it must have kind of felt a bit like validation uh, for creating the system. And were there? Uh, particular titles that you really enjoyed and also how much did piracy affect gilsoft right um just a couple of questions there isn't there i think uh we you know that conversation we had back to with graham about wouldn't it be nice to have this sort of 
program where we, where other people could do it. And he, I mean, he just turned up with with this sort of editor, which was so easy to use. And he, he you know, I remember the conversation. He said, "Well, well I don't know. You, you might be right, but I couldn't see us selling more than a hundred or two hundred copies. Really, I can't see that many people would be interested." And he, 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 I don't think he. I mean, I, I was young. I was. I thought everything was going to sell a million copies. You know, <laughs> but um, I, I felt that it was really something that would would do well. And and so yes, I suppose seeing people writing games with it was was a massive, a massive um, vote for the the belief we'd had in in the product and and the money we'd poured into it as well because obviously we'd moved from this you know a, 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 a design the early design drawn by a school friend to have a you know professional bit of artwork drawn and and what I thought was some beautiful packaging developed for this to to stand out on the shelves of Smiths and and things as the you know and, and shops and and it was it was a, a really nicely presented package and. To actually see people using it uh, was brilliant, especially when you started to see commercial games being written with it as well that was also selling well. Um, you know, things like Dennis through the Drinking Glass, you had Hampstead. The, the, the people were produced, and, and obviously all the, 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 the Delta Four games they were my favorite i loved the pure humor that fergus put into his games it was it was just great fun board of the rings was a brilliant game you know so there's there's a real they were a real advert for our product there's no two ways about it um their their ability to commercialize a, um, a, a really good game as well helped to sell the quill because you know it's a natural snowball people see oh i could actually sell a commercial game with this um, and you could, yeah, because again, it's content's king. It's not really the tool that's that's doing the work. It's it's taking some of the drudgery out of it, but it's still you who's creating the game. So, I think that was to answer the first question. That is, yes, it was, and it obviously proved to Graham along with his royalty checks, <laughs> which were were quite significant at the time. I think um, probably more than his main job. So, um, you know, that certainly validated it. There's no two ways about it. And, and it was great. In terms of games that we were sent, they were obviously highly varied in quality. Um, but, you know, the ones that did come in that we, we really did, we, we had to like evaluation sheet and a few of us would give, it a, give the games a go and anything we really liked, uh, we, we started to look at marketing ourselves, um, which led to the gold collection of some key ones. And there were some really clever ones in that set, I think. Um, Mindbender and Spyplane was a really unusual take on it. It's a, a sort of mission flyover. I haven't seen anything similar to it till recently one in the uh, um, the adventure on Game Jam where there was a Bowerbird one where you've got a, um, well, I won't give it away if anyone hasn't played it, but it's a, it's quite a clever idea and a, a technique to be a bird. And uh, I'll give you one little hint. I mean, you know, birds can fly in this there's ups and downs to trees but it's great fun this concept of doing something totally different with the genre was was there in that game devil's island was a great one and some of the ones like madcap manor uh, which we sold outside of the gold collection were really deserving of the you know of a full price title you know, they were they were they were just great fun games to play you know, and it gave that sort of feeling of wandering around a, a mysterious manner. And it gave you that sound. I think you touched on it earlier. There's so many things the player could do. And I've I've always thought that the reason adventure games are so appealing is you've no idea how much is in the game. You have to explore mm. it. You've, you, you've got no sense. You are completely at the... All you see is this sort of, I suppose you call it the fog of war in a war game. You only see the bits you've already seen as the map emerges. So the possibilities are endless in it because you just... It's the limit of how you can imagine and move forward. And it's very satisfying when you do something and you discover it and you think, oh, I didn't know I could do that or I didn't know I could go oh, there. And, oh, yeah. oh, 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 people doing things with the quill, just unbelievable, you know. Yeah. What they could make it do was way beyond anything we thought it could do. You know, all the games, we, we if you look back at what we did, they were all very, you know, traditional, you know, uh, you know, in a castle, there's a princess, you rescue it, uh, you know, diamond trail with, the, you know, we get a jewel from, the, you know, the Sinclair diamond. It was very it was boring stuff, really, just to prove the technology worked almost. But um, you could, to see other people really making it sing and dance just just made the tool worth, and, and, and really the, the original idea from, from Ken Reed, clever, you know. Well, obviously you didn't rest on your laurels. I mean, you came out with professional adventure writer and then, the Illustrator as well, which added graphics yeah. as well. I mean, how did you kind of improve upon the Quill with these products then? And what right. was kind of the, okay. the reaction to those? Well, the, the Quill was a natural 
progression, I think, because obviously people wanted to add graphics like they'd seen in The Hobbit and some of the games that were starting to, to appear in The Hobbit. It was a very early adopter of graphics. Slow as they were, they were impressive. Um, Graham was never a big fan of the graphics side of it, which is why I, I turned my hand to the Illustrator fairly quickly so that people could add their graphics to the game. Um, you know, that was my... That was my thing. I thought from a commercial point of view, we, we needed to have our tool able to add graphics for people. Um, and I'd also watched, uh, you know, our, one of our uh, my friends, Hugh, the way he drew, and it, it, it was just little subtle movements of line would create an image that was visible. And I thought, well, that's got to be easy to do um, just that way to capture it. And you sort of had the, the background of the way these stored graphics were work. So the... Professional Adventure Writer was really um, a way to bring it back to the simplicity because we'd already launched other add-ons as well. They'd been submitted by people like um, Phil Wade had done um, the press for us and we had a character design program so you could do custom fonts. But it, we were moving away from this simplicity that you just had one program to do everything. It was your environment to develop. So as you call it an IDE today in modern development environment where you could do everything all in the one package and then test it straight away and go back out to get that immediacy so Paul was needed to, to bring those back together to put illustrator um, the press the characters editor all into one product and to make use of micro drives and disk drives to be able to create bigger games to use the 128k of memory of the, the spectrum 128 as it was then um, we needed to, an overhaul uh, we, we'd done quite well with it uh, Quill Illustrator it was codenamed of course initially <laughs> um, I've, I've got a photograph somewhere of a, a screenshot of it but it was madly accelerated by the launch of, uh, of GAC obviously um, suddenly we had competition in the market so uh, we, had to, we had to get it out quick and it was it was, it was that, just about making it dead simple for people to carry on and develop software all in this environment where they didn't have to th work too hard you're involved with the um, ZX Spectrum Next as well, aren't you? I am, yes. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty much um, a bit of an accident, really. I'd sort of started um, reading a little bit about retro computing after I'd been bought one of these um, Spectrum recreated Bluetooth keyboards as a Christmas present. And I'd found out I thought, oh, okay, some of my old tapes were in now. I wouldn't mind playing 3D Maze Gold again. I'd gone online and found out this massive community had kept the Spectrum alive. And um, and, and indeed other other retro computing. And it was a massive discovery of what was already there. I didn't have to recover it. it was, I could just download my own game and play it on an emulator. And, and through that reading around the topic, I came across the, the project for the next and started following it enthusiastically, thinking, oh, that would, you know, that looks really promising to have a obviously bought myself a few other spectrum peripherals modern ones like the uh, uh the sd card interfaces and i got back into the the sort of discovery and, and and that and the the next team were very uh interactive i can't remember how i ended up getting heavily involved in the actual next itself you know, somehow i was chatting to um uh, the developer of the next zx os and guy was uh there was a problem with the real-time clock. And again, this sort of speaks to my interest in electronics, I suppose. I've never really lost that. always like playing about with it. And ESX-DOS, which is the operating system you get on Spectrums for the SD card interface, has um, an ability to load a real-time clock to keep time and date stamp the files when you're saving and loading. It's not very well off supported on many of the, the devices but um, it has to fit in 256 bytes. So the next team had um, uh, adopted this because they tried to pull in the best of everything that's happened in the retro community. And um, they it didn't it only did the date, not the time. And uh, I got Chan and said, oh, I expect I could make that fit in 256 bytes. I'm sure I could improve the driver on that. Um, and I really got back into Z80 coding and thought, oh, this is fun. You know, I have to optimize it down and get it working. And sure enough, by the end of the, the fortnight, whatever, I'm going to play with it and got my oscilloscope out again to be able to look at the signals. I thought, oh, that's why it doesn't work. And, and really got involved with them and joined the chat and, and just really started to get enthusiastic about it. And obviously they were looking for um, people to, to help work on the um, network drivers the for the um, ESP chip that was in there as well. Um, so I, I, had, I started moving on to that as well. 
and just really they're a great group of guys and it, it's a great machine to 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 develop for it it brings back that moment when when you feel the machine in your hands it and even in the early days with just the dev board which i was lucky obviously i backed the kickstarter and got a dev board fairly early to work on all this um even that in its uh in its repro case felt like a real spectrum and it always did it brought back that moment of of having my spectrum originally from sinclair you could it gave that moment of excitement and the the sense of, of familiarity and, and an escape from the modern world you know it's uh, it's it's computing today is incredibly complicated you can't you can't do much without having to read you know acres and acres of documentation for highly complex apis to write a program and then the spectrum allowed you to, to really code down at the hardware level immediately and I really enjoyed that, and I just rediscovered what I what was the joy of computing in in 1980, probably 1981. So that's why, and I, I still love playing with it now. You know, it's a and it, it is just a great little machine. You know, before when you mentioned that sense of anticipation you had when the original Spectrum, when you ordered it and had to wait for it to be delivered. Yeah. When you said that, I'd instantly thought because I've actually backed the recent Kickstarter for the Spectrum next, and I thought I'm feeling like that now, yeah. waiting to get my machine yeah. when it arrives. Yeah. So. yeah, wait till you hold it in your hands. It's going to be yeah, just I'm... that first moment, exactly the same again. I promise you. Well, Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you on this week's show and um, get your stories, and I can't wait to see um, what you're going to be doing with the next one. I get my, my hands on one, hopefully, very soon. <laughs> um, of course, we'll link up your website as well. I mean, we could do a whole episode about <laughs> um, about the, the Bywood Scrumpy as well, which is really interesting. So I'll put a link to that and obviously everything else that we've talked about in our show notes. But really appreciate you coming on, Tim. Thank you for being our guest this week. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Is it over already? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. It does indeed, and that's part of what we should all be doing is enjoying this, isn't it? Because it's a, it's a, it's a great sense of uh, of joy for everybody, and everyone's enjoying it. You know, it, it's something you can do and, and feel great about. So, uh, anyway, thanks, guys. 